my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page physics center and school of astrophysics and astronomy and youtube channel pitam kumar das i would like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar good morning to all i think you are in a storm power pandemic so as we know that we are staying in a corona pandemic situation this is a new uh, type of experience we are having so we cannot continue our normal academic program inside the campus due to the corona pandemic so we have to start our online program i think you have already come to know that the department of physics of the university of science and technology has started its online program including online international physics webinar and we have successfully completed our 193rd international physics webinar and today it's our 194th and today i would like to welcome you all to a joint session between our department department of physics of the university of science and technology and the department of physics indian institute of technology madras chennai india and we have with us here today dr arul uh, dr arul lakshmi narayan sir professor of department of physics indian institute of technology madras chennai india i'd like to welcome our speaker sir good morning thanks for accepting our invitation sir it's my honor and privilege to host you in our international physics event so before going to you i would like to uh, inform our viewers and students that uh, we have divided our webinar into three parts first of all we would like to introduce our speaker with all of you and then our uh, speaker will deliver his speech and at the end we have a discussion session in that time anybody can join with us so i think uh, you have already come to know the title of this today's international physics webinar and title is the quantum entanglement many facets from chaos to many body system and our speaker is dr arul lakshmi narayan sir professor department of physics indian institute of technology madras chennai so we can see uh, that uh, our professor is working as a professor at the department of physics and indian institute of uh, madras and uh, his research interest is quantum chaos quantum information theory chaos and transport mathematical physics so uh, i think uh, we can uh, go to him so sir uh, it's your time you can start your session and the viewers and student you can also ask question uh, by commenting in facebook and youtube so thanks sir for giving us this opportunity to arrange such an important event Thank you very much, Professor Pritham. Uh, it's a it's an honor to actually be here and uh, uh, talk to you. It's uh, uh, so my uh, colleagues and uh, students at uh, Pabna. It is a strange time that we are in, yes. and uh, I am talking from Chennai, which is in South India, as you know, and you are in North Bangladesh. and uh, it's uh, it would be really nice if uh, we were there in person but of course this technology is also building bridges where it would have been hard for us to communicate or go to we are actually communicating very easily at the click of a button but nevertheless as i'm seeing what a beautiful place pabna is and i certainly hope to be there and i certainly hope that uh, you yeah, will of course sir i'll definitely Yeah, I'll definitely invite you, sir. After Thank the COVID, it's a, it's a very uh, wonderful thing to uh, be there. It's such a pity that we are not having more uh, exchanges with our own neighbors, and uh, it, it's uh, it's an opportunity which probably the pandemic will help us in this respect in this strange way. So I am going to talk about uh, two subjects which are close to my heart for a very long time. Uh, so. Uh, to uh, uh, give you an idea, it's about twenty years, I think, uh, since I started uh, thinking about these kind of questions. Uh, my PhD work was related to aspects of quantum chaos, and then later on, uh, I, I started uh, looking at what is the implications for quantum entanglement in the subject, and that was twenty years ago. But now, it's the, the subject is actually very active. uh and, and has many connections to uh experiments as well as to uh many fundamental questions of physics so i hope to convey just a small aspect of 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 this uh today 
uh, to you. Um, now, uh, um, I, I would uh, I would not mind if possible interruptions. I have no problem with that. But you could also ask me questions at the end if that's your format. That's perfectly all right. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you today is about quantum entanglement. And uh, so as I said, there were two aspects are there, are there in this which I have uh, been involved with. One is chaos itself and uh, quantum chaos especially. Uh, and the other is quantum entanglement. And so I want to convince you that actually there is a strong interconnection between these two uh, in the next uh, hour or so. So let's get started. Uh, uh, so this is a sort of rough outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about the chaotic universe, what does it mean to be chaotic, and then a little bit about quantum chaos. Then I will talk about its chaos, and then go on to many-body systems. I want to really go into many-body localization, which is also a very topical subject now, especially. And if not, let's we'll talk about out-of-time autocorrelators as, again, something very topical and, uh, and is a measure of these kind of uh, um, uh, things that chaos in the quantum world. So we are very familiar with in our background uh, of edu physics education. Very early on, we study the simple pendulum in high school, probably. We measure its time period and so on. And uh, we study formulas like time period is 2 pi square root of L by G. And then later on, we, st we, we study the uh, Kepler problem or the two-body gravitational problem. And a little bit later on, we actually solve for the things. We prove that uh, gravity is so very nice, that there is there's an elliptic orbit uh, for the planet around the sun, and the sun being one of the four sides. This is called a two-body problem. The connection between, apart from the fact that these are, we, we study this very early on in our uh, career in physics, they are very simple. So what exactly is the constants of motion? A constant of motion is any function of phase space, which does not change with time, although the phase space position itself is changing in time. So there is a flow in phase space. And so the position momentum is changing, but the function of position and momentum, let's say, is not changing. And these are constants of motion. And as you well know, energy is a constant of motion in a conservative system. Or more formally, a Hamiltonian is a constant if the Hamiltonian is not explicitly dependent on time. So that's in the number of uh, independent variables need to specify configuration of the uh, system. Like a Coulomb system, is, if we consider the, uh, the really a six degree freedom system, uh, system because each of the uh, sun and the uh, planets uh, have, each of the earth has three degrees of freedom and the sun has three degrees of freedom. But even if you freeze the sun as an, or go to center of mass coordinates, you still have three degrees of freedom. So it's a much more number of free, degrees of freedom is more. And the system is said to be integrable if the number of constants of motion is at least the number of degrees of freedom. So now you know that every Hamiltonian system, energy is conserved. So every one degree of freedom system is integrable. OK, and, uh, uh, and the Kepler problem or the two-body problem is also integrable, although there are three degrees of freedom. Energy is only one of them. But thanks to the conservation of angular momentum, it turns out that it's an integrable system because angular momentum, there are three coordinate, three uh, components of that. So there is sufficient, or all of them are conserved because it's a central force. So in fact, all central force problems are integrable problems. Um, 
But the Kepler problem is even a very special specific extent of motion due to a super integrable. There are even more number of constants of motion than the degrees of freedom. These are called super integrable systems. Now, what, why integrable systems are uh, uh, have been studied uh, or uh, uh, what characterizes integrable systems is that every constant of motion is usually associated with some kind of symmetry. So you have some large number of symmetries and the problem is that the constants of motion risk of movement in phase space and therefore integrable systems are in and that is very clear from these kind of uh, uh, you know like like in this two body problem the the motion may be looking complicated but is really either quasi periodic or periodic and in fact you know that because of the super integrable nature it, if it can ask the following question that if what happens if we have more number of degrees of freedom so a simple pendulum for example uh, just give me a minute a simple pendulum would now for example we can attach another pendulum to it so this is a famous double pendulum problem which is again solved in books and at, at a level where we are studying Lagrangians, we are asked to write Lagrangian of this and so on. It's a standard problem. But actually, it turns out that this is now two degrees of freedom. You have theta 1 and theta 2. And energy conservation alone does not make it integrable because you know, need another constant of motion. And it's not there. There is no other constant of motion. And therefore, the system is actually non-integrable. So this is an example of a non-integrable system. And non-integrable systems with given sufficient energy can display very, uh, very non-periodic, very complex motion. And in fact, this complex motion has come to be known as chaos. So this is a simulation of it, as I can't show you this. But if there are any students out there, I would highly encourage you to actually try to make a physical model, uh, take two stakes, take some ball bearings, whatever it is, use your ingenuity and make a double pendulum so that you can see it for yourself. Seeing it on YouTube is one thing, but seeing it for yourself is another. So it's a very simple thing to do. And uh, it, it illustrates, if you look at the second pendulum, especially the mass, the second mass down there, it will be undergoing motion, which is not only aperiodic, but looking very erratic. This is actually one of the, uh, the figure below shows you one of these uh, trajectories. And uh, so the once you step out of one degree of freedom, it's possible to have non-integrability. And not only non-integrability, it implies the, uh, the emergence of motion, which looks almost random, which is known as chaos. Now notice that there is nothing random about this double pendulum in the sense that there are no random forces. It's not because of the atmosphere or something like that. It's a perfectly deterministic system. But this deterministic system shows apparently non-deterministic or random solutions. And the same goes with the gravitational problem. If you take three gravitational bodies, uh, this Motion can be very much complicated. It's in fact uh, can be chaotic too. And in fact, in the literature on chaos, Henry Poincaré first studied the three-body problem as an example of chaos. So, so this is uh, simulation probably doesn't work here. So, what is shown here is our two gravitational uh, masses, which are very heavy, and a third mass, which is. Uh, which is moving in the gravitational field of these two. So this is known as a restricted three-body problem, uh, wherein two of the masses are very super heavy, and you have another mass which is moving between them. And you can see the trajectory of the mass which is moving between them. It's far from being it's a, any closed orbit. It's in fact has very similar characteristics to that of this pendulum, double pendulum, and it can be chaotic. Uh, of course, you can ask, but what about the solar system? Solar system is many more than uh, three bodies. And is it chaotic? Is it chaotic is an important question because our life depends on it in a sense, because uh, if it is not stable, we can wander away. In fact, 
this is a very important problem that was not settled and even now uh, the it's not fully settled but the view now is that it is in fact not stable it's it, it's just that the unstable parts of this or the very chaotic parts of this have already left the solar system and uh, what remains are relatively stable planets and they will be going around for some years but there is a some amount of chaos and the most chaotic of these is pluto which has been as you know downgraded from a planet already and the pluto will the pluto will leave the solar system in about a million years or so so uh, so these are the complications that come when you just step out from just 1 to 2 degrees of freedom or uh, higher what characterizes this chaos so one of the most important thing that characterizes this chaos and which which is known as the sensitive dependence on initial conditions that is if you start two trajectories now this delta x here is not just a position but it could be a phase space coordinate so it can include both position and momentum and this trajectory is a trajectory in phase space so if you start from this point here you can this is trajectory 1 after a time t it goes here this is another trajectory nearby it starts from this so initial time delta x0 is here and then what you find is that these near nearby trajectories go far away after some time and in fact this how far away they go if it is exponentially growing with time that is known to be a chaotic system so you may think about this as a definition of chaos as a simple definition of chaos that there is exponential sensitivity to initial conditions okay so this is some distance between these two and this exponential rate is known as the lyapunov exponent so if this lyapunov exponent is positive you may think about this as a chaotic system and so when we talk about whether the solar system is chaotic or not what we are trying to do is find a lyapunov exponent for this so there is sensitive dependence on initial conditions but sensitive about unstable something some particle sitting on top of a well for a, on top of a hill for example they will just roll down it's an unstable situation but actually chaos is a combination of the sensitive dependence with a compact phase space things cannot run off to infinity although these trajectories are diverging exponentially they are living in a finite space namely the energy shell the energy shell has a finite volume the energy is not changing and therefore this cannot just deviate exponentially forever so in fact in the definition of the lyapunov exponent there is also a limit when this delta x0 is taken to be zero so there is a folding back of these trajectories which are unstable and that leads to chaos or deterministic randomness quite so simply as if there is sensitive dependence on initial conditions uh and so in fact all one degree of free all systems with one degree of uh, more than one degree of freedom can be chaotic when i say are chaotic it's not uh, correct okay i have actually said almost all so then it's correct so almost all systems with greater than one degree of freedom are chaotic for example uh, if you if you find so in fact integrable systems are rare you have to look for them whereas the generic systems are chaotic here is another simple example you don't need very complicated systems you just need a free particle so this is a free particle moving in a two dimensional space but it's bouncing off the surface it's like a carrom board which is of the shape so it's called a stadium billiard because it's like a billiard ball moving inside a stadium shaped table and you just have a ball which is coming here let's say with this velocity it's going there and then it's getting reflected according to the usual law of reflection that angle of incidence equals angle of reflection that's all we apply this and see what happens to two nearby trajectories which are starting off from here and going to the right and hitting this semicircular path part so let's just see what happens to it 
So it's bouncing off that wall, it's bouncing off that wall. And now you can see how many trajectories are there. It wasn't just one trajectory. They're all starting to diverge from each other. And after some time, there is no connection between these two, these various trajectories. They're just moving in all kinds of different directions after some time. So this is, in fact, what happens when there is chaos. And uh, uh, this is, I've taken a simulation from this website called Julia Dynamics, which I will highly recommend. Julia is a program like Python, a free, but it's, it's also free like Python, but especially suited for uh, physics. And uh, there are very interesting uh, simulations of this in, in that. So there is sensitive dependence, which I've shown in this case. I will pause here. I've been about talking for about 20 minutes. If there are any questions or clarifications, I can take them right now. Is that okay, Pritham, or should I continue? Yes, okay, okay, sir. We haven't uh, got any question. Okay, sir, you can, you can continue. Sir. Okay. So I'm going to talk about some simple models of chaos. I've been talking about simple models of chaos, in fact. Well, double pendulum is too complicated for me. Uh, but even more simple uh, thing we saw was a free particle in the stadium billiard. But even that is actually quite, quite involved. So let's take something which is even more simpler. Let's go back to a simple pendulum. But it's not so simple now because we kick it. So there is a time dependence on it. So this is a very famous model called the, uh, well, it's called many names. Here I've called it the standard map, which comes out of it. So what it means, let us think about it physically as if, well, we may think about it as a game of football. I'm sure it's popular in Bangladesh as much as in um, India, especially uh, Bengal. Um, so a football is a free particle, except when it meets a player and the player imparts an uh, impulse to it by kicking it. And then the momentum changes instantaneously and till it meets another player or some other object. And then it changes its momentum again. So the momentum is constant till it is kicked. And then again, it's constant till it's kicked the next time and so on. So we play this game on a, let's say, on a circle now. Okay, so our football field is just one uh, circle. And on the circle, there is this football, and its angle is Qn. This n here is the time of kick. Okay, so here we are going to kick it at regular intervals. So the ball is going to meet a player every one second or one unit of time. So that is this n here, that is time. So this is the angle. And uh, let's say that it was given a momentum, which was Pn, after the nth kick. Okay. Now, what happens after the n plus 1 kick. After the n plus 1 kick, the momentum, the angle is qn plus 1, but the momentum is now going to be changed from pn. It's going to be changed to some pn plus 1 because of the kick. Okay, so now how much is this change pn plus 1 from pn? So that is going to be determined, and this is the impulse, is going to be determined by a potential. And that potential is this harmonic, uh, sorry, this pendulum potential. So this is called the kick pendulum, if you want, okay, kicking a pendulum. So without this kick, if it is there all the time, it's just a simple pendulum and it's not chaotic, it's integrable. But once there is this kicking, because of this time dependence, it's not there all the time, it becomes a non-conservative system. Energy is not constant. So now, you can see that the angle qn plus 1, how much is it? So suppose we take the time between the kicks as one unit. This is the old angle plus the angular momentum is now called pn. So pn into time t, which is 1. So qn plus 1 is the position of the particle or ball immediately after the n plus 1th kick. And that is equal to the position or the angle uh, just after the nth kick plus the momentum after the nth kick. <laughs> The momentum just after the n plus 1 kick is now not, not equal to pn, but is differing by this. And this k is a kicking strength. So the faster, the harder one, the k, the larger k is one is kicking it harder. Okay, and this momentum is 
increasing. But of course, it's in a circle, so it's not going very far. Our football field is closed. So now, you see, this is a very simple thing. But remember that this is QN plus 1. That's very important because that is the position at N plus 1. thing. It's not QN. So now it's a discrete thing. You don't even have to solve a differential equation. You have to solve a difference equation. In fact, if you have never done this, I would encourage you to write a simple program, Python, Mathematica, MATLAB, whatever you want, and simply iterate this for some given value of k for a given q0, p0. That's the initial condition. And see what happens to this qn, pn as a function of time. That is the orbits of this. And you will see something very interesting. Here I have plotted this thing. It's called a phase space now. So I'm plotting q on the x-axis, momentum p on the y-axis. So there is position, momentum. The position is going from 0 to 1. So that is my angle, 0 to 2 pi is made 0 to 1. And momentum, uh, I'll tell you in a minute what I'm doing to the momentum, but you can just think about it as momentum, the usual PM. So this is for k is small, 0 0.2. And uh, you see uh, many initial conditions. Each initial condition is giving rise to one of these orbits. Okay, so here is this initial condition. It's just giving rise to this orbit, which means that the momentum is almost a constant. It's going around the circle like this. And then it's coming back. It's going around the circle like this. Okay, that's what it means. Whereas here, the momentum, uh, the, it's not going around the circle. It's just going here, and then it's coming back. So it's, it's just oscillating about a particular point. It's not going full on the circle whereas these are going full on the circle. So what does this remind you of? What picture does this remind you of? Uh, I'm sure that it reminds you of a, a, a simple pendulum phase space, which you would plot in a course in mechanics. So although there is a difference, it's not a flow in phase space because each point is marked only after a time end. So it's a discrete set of points. But it looks like, in fact, a pendulum phase space and there is no chaos in it. When we increase this kicking strength to 1.2, then we see very interesting things happening. In fact, there is a whole lot of things in between which I haven't shown, but you can see already in this that it's a very different kind of phase space. You can now see regions like these where you have a point which is going all over this place. It's not restricted to a curve. It's going all over this place. And in fact, it's a very complicated thing. There are some curves which are regular, which are non-chaotic orbits, we would say. And these are examples of chaotic orbits. So this is a case of, in fact, most of the physical systems are in this kind of a range, what is called a mixed phase space, where there is, depending on the initial condition, whether it's chaotic or not. Here is 2.5. Uh, and then you can see that actually now, if I start from some initial condition, it's going to go all over the place in some random manner. And there is chaos here. So it's actually a single initial condition is doing this. But there are still islands of regularity. That's at 2.5. At 9, there is. I'm just plotting one initial condition, not many, just one initial condition. And you see that it's filling up this entire available phase space. So this is an example of a fully chaotic system and I have to now tell you what I'm doing to the momentum because the momentum can go to infinity, can increase, can go to plus or minus infinity because you're putting in energy into the system via the kicks. However, I'm restricting the momentum to lie between 0 and 1 by putting boundary conditions, periodic boundary conditions on the momentum. This may look artificial to you, but I don't want to go into it to tell you that actually it's not artificial and it's in fact quite a natural thing to do in this system. So this phase space is restricted to what's called a torus because there's periodic boundary conditions both in the angle, which is natural, as well as in momentum. Okay, so this transition from k is 0 0.2 when it's looking almost like a simple pendulum to 9 when it's fully chaotic is a very interesting transition. And it is it involves some of the uh, great theorems which were discover, discovered in the 20th century about classical mechanics. The breaking of these tori is related to what's called the kolmogorov arnold moser theorem. And uh, also the some of the resonant tori, so to speak, are the Poincare-Birkhoff theorem. So there is a lot of 
the interesting mechanics which is there here which is not taught in high school i mean taught in schools or colleges also you know not even in university masters degrees unfortunately uh, and also there are a lot of open problems in this so i have been talking for this first half an hour really about qua- classical whereas i promised to talk about entanglement quantum and all that so this is a stage which i have set because chaos is something which is not that well appreciated by the students especially so i thought of spending some time on this and i pre- i would uh, imagine that it's quite easy to do this with for anybody with a computer or actually even make a double pendulum okay so what is uh, let me just uh, have one final slide on the classical instead of talking about what happens to one orbit we can talk what happens to a collection of orbits or a density okay so let's look at what happens to a density which is concentrated here so you can see that when k is 0 by the way i should i should have mentioned that i'm sorry when k is 0 that is the case when there is no kicking here but you are just looking at the particle every one second then nothing happens it's actually a free particle on the circle so it's just a momentum is conserved now and and therefore uh, th- th- this is an integrable system and therefore when k is zero it's an integrable system when k is non zero it's an in- non integrable system although this looks like an integrable system it's what would be called a near integrable system but is being actually it's pushed into chaos as k is increased so when k is zero it's an it's just a free particle on a circle and this time is discrete that's why it's seeing like this and you can see that nothing much happens to the momentum it is just right because momentum is constant it but there is diffusion in the position this direction that's along the angle along the circle there is diffusion so but if this is what happens to the same thing when k is 9 and when there is complete chaos you see so there is this bunch of particles just takes off initially there is there is some structure which is well understood but after some time it's just all over the place so in fact this is very much related to the process of equilibration in statistical mechanics so statistical mechanics requires us to have assumes ergodicity and mixing and this is an example of that so this ergodicity and mixing and this and simple statistical behavior emerges if there is chaos so this is something which i want to emphasize now you may say okay all that is fine but we know that quantum mechanics is the theory why should i bother about this uh and indeed this is true and it was asked when people were appreciating chaos classical chaos simultaneously questions were asked about quantum chaos so in the 70s 80s 90s were heady days for understanding chaos and also quantum chaos started around 1979 and there are many examples and applications of this starting from nuclear physics resonance is a heavy nuclei qcd is a strongly coupled nonlinear theory hydrogen atom which we study in uh, quantum mechanics first course but if you put it in electromagnetic fields strong electromagnetic fields where the electric and magnetic fields are competing with the coulomb forces the uh, the hydrogen atom is an example of a chaotic system class a quantum chaos chaotic system and the spectra of the hydrogen atom in these electromagnetic fields has been studied now for a while the helium atom the simplest atom which you can go is already a three body problem with a heavy nucleus and two electrons so that is looking like already a three body problem and in fact there is quantum chaos in the, in the helium atom and needless to say molecules like the water molecule and so on the excited states of these are all examples of quantum chaos so you don't have to look very far chaos is not something very strange you don't have to go to a zoo to see this animal it's there all over the place uh misoscopic transport in quantum dots so as long as quantum effects start becoming important you can have dots for example quantum billiards i've shown you billiards so you can have quantum dot shaped as billiards and there is a lot of difference between transport properties if the billiard is non integrable such as the stadium billiard or it's integrable i failed to mention to you that integrable billiards also exist of course a circular billiard which we study also in quantum mechanics is integrable 
Another integrable system which we study in quantum mechanics is a rectangular box. Both are integrable, but in fact, it's very hard to find integrable shapes. And uh, I welcome you to try that. So in fact, there is strong transport property differences in mesoscopic transport and quantum dots, depending on whether there is chaos or not. Quantum phase transitions, spin systems, quantum computers, quantum metrology, these are all finding applications, and quantum chaos finds applications in all of these kind of things. It's a very ongoing field. I hope to give you some flavor of it in the coming few minutes. And in the foundations of quantum statistical mechanics, naturally, because of the connections to equilibration in closed systems and isolated systems via chaos, quantum field theories, quantum gravity, now black holes are considered to be in a sense, the most chaotic, quantum chaotic objects in the universe. So they are, again, uh, there is, there is well, quantum gravity, one may argue, there's no theory of it as such, but, and I'm not an expert on it, but there are uh, various reasons to believe that the existing theories of this, in fact, the, uh, the, the, the quantum properties of a black hole are like that of a highly chaotic, quantum system. Okay, so, uh, so uh, uh, quantum chaos is something old, but it has all of these very new ramifications which are going on in the last few years. So let me, I showed you some pictures of what's happening in classical phase space. I want to show you what's happening in quantum phase space, just to, for, just for fun. But in fact, quantum phase space does not exist because position momentum cannot be observed at the same time, Heisenberg. So, but in fact, there does ex do exist states which are very close to being classical known as coherent states. And we study that also in courses in classical quantum mechanics as states which minimize the uncertainty product. So what we would take is do is take an initial state, which is a coherent state, which is a minimum uncertainty wave packet, which is as close to classical as possible, and we will evolve this coherent state and see what happens to the coherent state. And what I'm visualizing is the coherent state in a coherent state basis. So this is actually now a quantum pseudo phase space, if you wish. I'm plotting position and momentum here. And when I plot such a picture here, you should imagine a quantum state which is highly localized in position here with an expectation value of position being at the center of this and momentum expectation value being here, and maybe delta P being this width and delta X being that. Okay, so in fact, the pictures are such that you can find an effective Planck constant, which is just a product of these two. So there is an effective Planck constant in these problems, and that is the inverse of the number of states which are involved in this. So this is actually 100 states I've, I'm going to do. I'm going to do exactly the same quantum kick, uh, kick pendulum, but I'm now going to quantize it. Okay, so the number of states is 100, and this effective Planck constant is 1 over 100. Now, let's see. That was the classical in the integrable case. So now let's do the quantum integrable case. And you see that this wave packet is spreading naturally. It's diffusing. And then it is having some very interesting structures which are coming here. So it's just from 4. So it's splitting up into some four coherent states, three coherent states, and maybe uh, even two coherent states like now, and then it comes back to itself. So in fact, what is going on is known as fractional revivals. It's also a very interesting phenomenon in this very simple system. It was studied in the uh, in 1990s uh, extensively uh, by, in fact, Michael Berry and other people. Uh, but uh, but what I want to say in this is that there is a similarity between classical and quantum for some time. You can imagine that this is looking like this for some time till quantum interference effects start. That time is known as the Edenfist time. The Edenfist time is a time till which the classical and quantum correspondence exists. And for the case of integrable systems, these people, Berry and Nandor Balaj, in 1982, as far as that, said that it's actually a long time. It scales as one over the effective Planck constant to the power of half. 
In terms of the number of states here that are involved, it's square root of n. So about 10 steps, there will be quantum classical correspondence. After that, quantum effects dominate. In fact, the revival time when it comes is n, which is much larger than this Erenfest time. Now let us see what happens if we have chaos. But before that, let's do an intermediate case when you have both chaos and regularity. So you're starting from something, it's, it's like undergoing a bunch of phase space points. This is now classical. And you can see that there is some chaos, but there are some regions which are excluded because there are regular regions there. The corresponding quantum one will be doing very similar. Now in phase quantum phase space, you will be seeing this. It's just what you're seeing, quantum classical correspondence is now existing for a long time. There may be some tunneling, quantum tunneling, which is going to classically forbidden regions, but is largely in the classically allowed region. And where there is chaos, you can see this background. So this is for a slightly larger value than similar uh, things are going on. OK, so with this very simple model, and this quantum is also very easy to do. It's just a finite quantum mechanics, because this, the corresponding operator, which is there for this, is known as a fluke operator. It's just a unitary operator. So it's just a 100 by 100 matrix. So you can do these things. Uh, at uh, uh, on a small computer. And this is the case of fully chaotic. Fully chaotic, the classical picture, fully chaotic, oops, so let me try again. Mm. Okay, yeah. Uh, So what you can see is that that initial state is actually very quickly replaced by something which is just looking like uh, uh, like a mess. Uh, of course, there is it's not fully uniformly distributed, but there is these patterns here which are looking quite random. And these are in fact random. Uh, what has been found is that random waves, uh, superposing random waves with random directions and amplitudes, is a model for quantum chaos. Although how wave packets evolve in this. So the time period of the, I'm sorry, the Ehrenfest time of quantum classical correspondence is much shorter if there is chaotic systems. Excuse me. So in this case, when there is chaos, the Ehrenfest time scales as the logarithm of 1 over the Planck constant or the logarithm of the number of states. So it's much shorter there is a very short classical quantum correspondence. And uh, so to find quantum effects, a classically chaotic system quantized will show quantum effects much earlier than that of the corresponding integrable systems. So this is, uh, this is a very important uh, lesson which we have learned. What are the other implications of uh, quanta, uh, quantum chaos. So what, what exactly we mean by quantum chaos, we can take a simplistic view of saying that, OK, well, let's just quantize a chaotic system, a uh, classically chaotic system like a billiard, which is chaotic, or this simple pendulum, I mean, the kick pendulum, which is chaotic. Then we will call this, those systems quantum chaotic. So what characterizes their things like energy levels? That's something which we study first in quantum mechanics energy levels of particle in a box, hydrogen atom, and so on, harmonic oscillator. Can we see the effects of chaos on these energy levels? And the answer is yes. And here I've taken a picture from this article, Bohigas Giannani. And what they are doing is they're plotting here another billiard, which is chaotic. It's called the Sinai billiard. Okay, it's slightly different from the billiard, which I showed you, but you can just think about it like that. So these are the energy levels, ground state, first excited state, stuff like that. And what is interesting is that this is quite like that of the nuclei, nuclei resonances of a heavy nuclei here. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, Rbm 166 nucleus uh, neutron resonances so in fact, it looks pretty much 
like that. And these arrows, by the way, tell you that two levels are coming very close. So that's what it's. It's not exact degeneracy, but near degeneracy. Okay, so there is not very much near degeneracy. You can see in this that one or two occurrences have happened here. Three occurrences have happened of close levels. Whereas if you take prime numbers, so this is all just prime numbers organized. Okay, so we have two, three, five, seven, etc. And wherever there are two coming close, you know that they are twin primes, like uh, five and seven are twin primes, three and five are twin primes. So you can see that the occurrences of these twin primes or these nearby levels, if you want, of these numbers are much more frequent than they are occurring in the nucleus or on this. This is a random sequence. Okay, so you take some random numbers and you just arrange them in increasing order and you will find such a spectrum if you want. So here also the occurrences of nearby levels are much larger. In fact, they are looking like prime numbers rather than this nucleus or this chaotic system. I will not talk about the zeros of the zeta function. That's also very interesting, uh, but I don't have the time for that. And this is just a uniform spectrum like a harmonic oscillator. So there are obviously no levels coming close at all. Now, uh, what has all this got to do with physics? So this connection was uh, studied by in, via random matrix theory. Uh, in the uh, in the 50s, so a random matrix. So Wigner said the nucleus is too complicated. Hamiltonian is in fact unknown even at that time, and uh, maybe the forces are not exactly known. What we know is some symmetries, parity, symmetry, and so on. So he said, and we know that the Hamiltonian has to be Hermitian. He said that uh, I'm going to give up. I'm going to take the Hamiltonian as just a Hermitian matrix in which the entries are random numbers. So let me take the simplest random numbers, Gaussian random and uh, IID. Okay, so in fact, I'm sorry, here it should have been A, B, B, D. I was just writing a two by two example and it's going to be uh, if A, A, B, C, D are real numbers, then obviously for a Hermitian matrix, so B should be equal to C. So you will have A, B, and D to be independent Gaussian random numbers. And you can take also complex entries into these. So these will still be real, but these off-diagonal elements can be complex. But they have to be complex conjugate for this to be Hermitian. So he said, let's take such random matrices and find out their eigenvalues. And how are their eigenvalues looking? How are they distributed? And in fact, much to their surprise, they found that if they take such random matrices and they find the spacing of these nearby energy levels, it's now statistical. So they do a distribution of this. You have so many spacings of the nearest neighbors. You find the spacing from a nuclear experiment, you will find these histograms. And if you do it from this random matrix, as I have described it here, you will find the smooth curve that's known as the Wigner distribution now. So this is an experimental data fitted to this random matrix of, called GOE from Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. It fits beautifully from this. So this is there in a review of modern physics from 1983. Whereas if you take levels which are uncorrelated, this is what you will get e to the minus x. It's known as Poisson distribution. Okay, so that spectrum will be looking like this Poisson, whereas the spacing distribution here is like this. And the fact that no two levels are close by is telling you that actually there is what is called level repulsion. So there is level repulsion, whereas for uh, random uh, statistics, there will be no level repulsion. They can two levels can come arbitrarily close to each other. Uh, may I stop here and ask Pritam how many how much time do I have? Uh, uh, you can talk about uh, I mean another ten to fifteen minutes. Okay, thank you. So I haven't yet come to entanglement. That's but that's that's me always. Okay, so. Um, 
so that was the status with nuclei but you know nuclei is too complicated for me i was doing simple stuff so what is what happens to simple stuff like the billiard coming back to the billiard problem which is chaotic you can find out the energy levels in that by doing numerics and solving the schrodinger equation numerically you can find out the energy levels of a particle in a box shaped in that size in that shape in fact again it's the sinai billiard which is actually just a square billiard in which a circular cavity has been removed at the center okay so this is actually 1/8 of that shape is shown here okay so uh these people bohigas oriol bohigas was uh also uh involved you see in this reviews of modern physics paper about doing nuclei so they are nuclear physicists and they said let's look at the simple system let's look at its nearest neighbor spacing statistics and to their surprise they found that that also fit exactly the goe curve that is a wigner statistic so the levels of this simple chaotic system were that of a complex nuclei were the same so this is known as universality so there is what they have what they found was a uh, universality and they conjectured that the characterization of quantum chaotic spectra and universality the level of fluctuations so 1984 it's known as a bgs conjecture it is found that level fluctuations of the quantum sinai billiard are consistent with the predictions of the gaussian orthogonal ensemble this reinforces the belief that level fluctuation laws are universal so if you take a chaotic system and quantize it what you will find is that the nearest neighbor spacing statistics of energy levels have a repulsion and they fit like this what about if you do for a non chaotic system so a non chaotic billiard are things like a circle billiard or a square billiard or an elliptic billiard in fact these are the three only things that i know maybe apart from a equilateral triangle which are integrable uh so if i if you take these and these you can do you know that this is related to bessel function zeros and these are very simple this is just n square plus m square kind of things you can find out the nearest neighbor statistics of that and you will find that it fits beautifully the poisson statistics of random numbers so in fact it might seem a little bit contradictory first that the integrable ones the nearest neighbor spacing is as if the as if the energy levels were random whereas if it is a chaotic one it's actually very highly correlated and there is level repulsion and you will find the random matrix result of this goe so i should say that there's also a goe here for unit universe uh, for unitary ensemble it's still a hermitian uh, things but it's 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 applicable to systems which break time reversal symmetry so this oe orthogonal is when it's the, when there is a time reversal symmetry this is when there is no time reversal symmetry so uh, these things are time reversal symmetric systems and they follow this so chaotic systems follow this so called wigner surmise of the nearest neighbor spacing statistics they satisfy this integrable systems they satisfy this so that's a very different uh, thing recently these days especially in the in uh, condensed matter physics uh, what is studied is not the distribution of the spacing themselves but the average of the ratio of near next nearest spacing so spacing sn divided by sn minus 1 this ratio of spacings and it is found that this average is about 0.39 if the system is integrable it's about 0.52 if it is chaotic so this bgs conjecture is that statistical properties of quantum chaos are those of random matrices eigen values in quantum chaos appear as strongly correlated random variables okay so i want to now switch to a thing gears and say what has all this got to do with entanglement and first i have to say what is entanglement for those of you who are not familiar so quantum entanglement is a property of quantum states but now of many particles so this so far what i have been discussing this is just one particle in a circular cavity or stadium billiard whatever there's only one particle but now we can have two particles for example in this thing they may be repelling each other or they may be not even talking to each other well, they have to be talking to each other so they won't get entangled let's say that you have two electrons here they may be 
mildly uh, repelling each other, but they can also be hitting this boundary and going off into this. Okay, so this is a, quite a hard problem, by the way, just putting uh, inter uh, uh, interacting particles in these cavities. Uh, but you can now ask, what is the many particle properties? So suppose you have two spins. This is the simplest situation, spin half particles, so up and down, so zero and one. So this is a spin singlet state, the famous spin singlet state. Very simply, uh, entanglement for a pure state is when it cannot be written as a state corresponding to one particle times a state corresponding to another particle. That means we cannot ascribe a quantum state to a many particle, uh, to individual particles of a many particle system. That is what it is. So here is a two particle state. Although the singlet state is a perfect pure state, we cannot ascribe any pure state to spin one or spin two. So that is entanglement. And uh, you may think that entanglement is a property of superposition. That's not true. Just to give you here, this is a superposition of all possible uh, two state systems, which are known as qubits. Uh, so zero is one, black is another. So these are the four possible classical states, zero, 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 one, one, zero, zero, one. I'm sorry, this should be one, one. Uh, but all possible linear combinations of these are also valid states. So as long as this state cannot be written as a tensor product of one particle and the other, then it is entangled. So in fact, it's very simple to find the condition for this. In this case, you just put this um, coefficients in a two by two matrix, and you see that the determinant is not zero. If the determinant is zero, then you can write it in this product form. So this seems like a mathematical property. What has it got to do with physics? In physics, it says that actually entanglement cannot be created locally. You have to have some interaction. What it also means is that you cannot decrease it by local operations such as measurements or applying fields to individual particles. And you, as you also know, the, that entanglement is sort of like if you make some change here, it seems as if you're making a change to non-locally to some particle, which is potentially very far away. So this is a so-called spooky action at a distance. But this is not in, as is quite well appreciated, is not in contradiction to any laws of physics. So uh, Schrodinger appreciated this in very early on in uh, in uh, uh, in this. So I, I, let me not go into the details of how you're going to measure this entanglement. Let me just, okay, maybe I will just tell you in words. It's very simple. You don't have to go through the mathematics here. If you have two particles A and B labeled, and if you have a pure state of this A and B, so you have a joint state of this, you can trace out one of these particles, let's say B, and find a state of A. This will in general be a mixed state. And this mixed state is given by this density matrix rho A. And if we have this coefficient matrix capital A from this, these are the coefficients written in some product basis, then this density matrix is nothing but A, A adjoint, where this A is this matrix. Okay, so you just have to trace this out. And all the properties of entanglement come from the spectrum of this reduced density matrix. So this is known as a reduced density matrix. And its entropy is the entanglement entropy. So that is the amount of entanglement in this pure state. And the eigenvalues of this density matrix are denoted by this lambda i. Then that is how you calculate this ent entropy. If the state is unentangled, it can be the, de the reduced density matrix is also a pure state, in which case the von Neumann entropy vanishes. So the unentangled states have zero only unentangled states have zero entanglement. And if the system is a finite, living in a finite dimensional space, n into m, where n and m are the dimensions of system A and B, and if n is a smaller of the dimensions, the maximum entanglement can be is log n. And that is for maximally entangled states. For example, this, uh, this state here lives in a two into two space, and it is a maximally entangled state and its entropy is log two, or it's known as one e bit of entanglement. Okay, so what has all this got to do with chaos? So let me just say that, uh, that if you have a system, uh, maybe I will skip this 
thing here, uh, or maybe I will just say it in words. So again, if you have an n into m system, and now you pick the state psi a b at random, at random meaning that they're all states, you may think of the states as being uniformly distributed in some space, you just pick a random state from this uniformly, and you ask how much entanglement is there, and then you calculate the average of that entanglement. That average entanglement was shown by Don Page from a cosmology uh, motivation to be equal exactly to this. So it's a beautiful formula which was conjectured by him and then proved by others. But just to give you the essence of this, it tells you that it is log n minus n by 2m, where this n and m are again the dimensions. So for example, n equals m, both of the systems are equal dimension, is minus 1 half. And there is log m. But log n is the entanglement of maximum entanglement. So in fact, what it says is that typical pure states are nearly maximally entangled. OK, so now comes again our main topic of chaos. Now we, what we do is we take the systems which are chaotic, like those pendulums which I showed you. But now we'll take two pendulums that are chaotic, and we will couple them, like the double pendulum case. And we will find how much entanglement is developed now in the quantum case as a function of time. So this is just, I'm just skipping the details. This is an early work of ours in 2002. We showed that actually the entanglement, if you start from an unentangled state, increases and reaches the random matrix or this average value predicted by Don Page's calculation. Although when we wrote this paper, uh, yes, we had just found out about that paper. Itself. And so this is a random matrix value that it reaches. Okay, uh, So there is a rapid growth of entanglement and then a saturation at predicted by random matrix theory. So you may think about this as if there is some thermalization which is going on in a, in a isolated system where the entropy is undergoing a, a growth, monotonic growth with time and then saturating that entanglement is playing the role of the entropy. Now, you may ask also finer questions, but I think I will skip this for the lack of time about the distribution of the eigenvalues and its connections to other things. So since there was a title has many body system, I think in the last few minutes, I will just tell you about many particle systems. Um, or maybe I will actually, uh, Let's say, okay, let me just at least spend this uh, slide a little bit here. So quantum chaos can be detected, as I said, by random matrix properties. And it leads to actually large entanglement. But it leads to actually large what's called multi-party entanglement of pure state. So now I have talked only about entanglement of two particles. Now if I have more than one part, two particles, like this connection of collection of spins here, what is getting maximized is actually the entanglement of one bunch of spins with the rest of the spins. Okay, so that is also a type of multipartite entanglement. So this multipartite entanglement is enlarged if there is chaos or quantum chaos. And it scrambles information exponentially fast. Like for example, if you take this bunch of spins and these two are entangled initially, maximally entangled state like a singlet, then if you put it under a quantum chaotic evolution, you cannot recover the information that this was in an entangled state. All this entanglement would be spread out among all of these particles. Okay, So that's what is known as scrambling. And uh, these are actually, uh, these indicate that there are lack of what are called quasi particles and it drives subsystems to thermalization. So in fact, this is a form of thermalization. Okay. so. I, I think I will skip these things, but you can find these by just looking at models now, which are like spin models. If you're a condensed matter physicist, you will appreciate that this is nothing but an icing model in a field which is both got a transverse direction, that is this X, as well as longitudinal direction called Z. If you had only longitudinal or transverse, this would be an integrable system, whereas if you have both of them simultaneously, it's non-integrable. In fact, you will find nearest neighbor spacing distributions like we saw for the billiard. But now it's a many particle system. And this entanglement will be increasing with this angle of tilt. And so this is integrable cases and these two non-integrable cases maximize the entanglement. 
Okay, so this is again some early work of ours. Um, and uh, it's found in nature, both in the journal as well as in experiments. Uh, there's been several experiments that have been done. I'm just going to point out to one experiment, I think in 2009. This has to do with cold atom experiment. Uh, it's quantum signatures of chaos in a kick top, uh, where they found connections between entanglement and chaos, like I've been talking about. These are more recent experiments, quantum thermalization through entanglement in an isolated many body system. And another experiment, rather recent experiment, which has to do with qubits, which are implementing a kick uh, top, like the kick pendulum, which I said, but these are now angular momentum operators, J, Y, J, Z squared. And what they find is, let me just show you, okay, this is all some mathematics of that. These are the kind of phase space plots I was showing you. Here is an integrable system, chaotic integrable system. What they do is they start off a quantum state. These are experiments. They start off a quantum state in some region here and then find the entanglement of this. So I should say that this is a three qubit experiment. So there are three qubits, so the spin is three half. And uh, this is a, a superconducting Josephson junction experiment. Uh, and they find the entanglement between one spin and the other two spins. And they find that if it starts in a corresponding classical regular region, not much entanglement is developed. That is uh, here, whereas, uh, uh, well, this is this case is more clearer. Where there is chaos, there is more entanglement. This is blue color. And where there is regularity, there is less entanglement. That is this red color. Okay. So I will stop here. I should just point out that this particular experiment, although it seems to be chaotic and all that, can be actually exactly solved. We solved that analytically quite recently, not only three, but also four qubit case. So I should also emphasize that chaos does not mean that you cannot solve it. Typically, that's the case, but not always. So let me also end by saying that generalizations of these to many particles I mean, uh, is uh, uh, to many gates and so on gives you actually one experiment, uh, which has got a lot of press last year or maybe two years ago, called the Google Supremacy Experiment, where they claim that this was a quantum computer which could could do something which classical computer could not do, uh, and uh, it relies exactly on a quantum chaos kind of experiment to do with many particle uh, non-integrable systems. And I will stop here. I will not go into what is called as OTOCs, out of time, out of correlators, but it's a very simple idea, but it's again, very interesting. It has to do with the growth of commutators and the connection of these to, uh, uh, to uh, chaos. So let me just summarize by saying that it's exciting times for quantum chaos, applications to condensed matter, quantum field theories, many basic questions remained unanswered. And Rather than giving you a summary, let me say that there are many, many uh, ingredients in this classical chaos, of course, what I started out with and what happens in the quantum domain, quantum chaos. There are inter intersections with many body physics, like the kind of icing models, which I showed you. Quantum information, of course, because entanglement plays a crucial role. Statistical properties of these are described by random matrix theory. So that plays a very important role. And then I did not talk about scrambling. Uh, I just told you roughly what is scrambling, but scrambling or is, is the spreading of information in a many body system is an important aspect. So that's scrambling. And then black holes, which I don't know much about, but it's a very interesting connection to quantum gravity. Uh, so all of them seem to form a very interesting spectrum for us to study. And uh, I think I have spoken for more than my time. So I. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy if there are, to answer any questions if there are. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. So I think uh, students have learned a lot of things about uh, this quantum chaos and quantum entanglement. So we have got a few questions in the inbox and in the comment section. So if you allow, we can start our discussion session, sir. Sure. The first question I'll take from the inbox. So what is the quantum dot? Oh, um, so
So in, uh, you can just think about it. We, we, we study in quantum mechanics, uh, the very first uh, step. So basically, a quantum dot is a particle which is confined in all parts of phase space, uh, in, uh, in all directions in space. OK, so x, y, and z, it's confined in that. So uh, like, for example, a 2D uh, surface, so this, this is something which is uh, confined in only one direction, the z direction, it can move in a, uh, so that's that's like a 2D gas, okay? But this one is something which is confined in all x, y, and z directions. So, I mean, this is like we study in quantum mechanics and the first thing we study particle in a box. So that is just a one dimensional example of a dot because it's not, there is no x and, uh, there's no y and z in that. In the x direction, you cannot go beyond uh, two limits. So the three-dimensional version of it is a box. So that is, that's all that is there. So a quantum dot is something like this, but then it's confined in space, but what is the confined region, shape of the region? That matters as long as you have what is called quantum coherence and your experiment can run in that time. So uh, uh, in that coherence time. So that's what, a, so nowadays one is making of course, smaller and smaller quantum dots and so as to, so that transport properties within that, you have some electron moving in there. The shape of the dot matters. It's not only the, uh, uh, it, it's not, it's, uh, it matters because it's coherent. Yeah. So that's what a quantum dot is. Thank you, sir. Uh, we've got another question. So what is the intermediate chaos? Uh, intermediate chaos. Uh, I may not have used that word, but I guess what you mean is mixed, where you have both chaos and regularity. Is that uh, what maybe? So depending on the initial conditions, so you have some phase space. First of all, you know this is something which we have to appreciate from classical mechanics. We take one degree of freedom system, the phase space you have corresponding to one energy, typically just one orbit. Right? I mean, you think of phase space of a harmonic oscillator, there are all these ellipses. You know, these. But once you go to two degree of freedom systems, the energy shell is three dimensional, whereas the orbit is only one dimensional, one D, one, one, one D curve, whereas the, uh, the energy shell on which it's moving is three dimensional like this room. So energy shell is not, can host and does host an infinity of possible orbits. At the same energy. So at the same energy, depending on where you start in your phase space, you can have chaotic or not chaotic orbits. And also you can have less chaotic or and more chaotic, even it's chaotic. So you can have all these variations within the same energy shell. So energy shell is a non-trivial space. So I guess by intermediate, uh, maybe if you mean mixed phase space, like I showed you for the, for the uh, square map, I mean, for the standard map with K is uh, two or something like that, you will find regions where it is regular. So that means that there is no sensitive dependence on initial conditions and regions where it is chaotic and there is sensitive dependence on initial conditions, positively and not exponent. I hope that is what you asked. Okay, sir, thank you, sir. Now we will go to our comment section. So the first question is, how does the hydrogen atom becomes a chaotic system? Uncertainty principle says we do not know the position and momentum of electron after all. Yeah, good question. Um, indeed, this is one of the basic issues that quantum chaos people had to face, namely that there is no phase space. That's a more general thing. Forget about even the hydrogen atom. Any system, where is a phase space for there to be sensitive dependence on initial conditions, right? So position, momentum, whatever it is, right? So, um, so the answer to the question is actually quite quite involved. But let me say that that is why people are studying so-called signatures of chaos in quantum mm -hmm. systems. You don't directly measure Lyapunov exponent. So this OTOCs, which I talked about, is one attempt at doing that. But even that has its limitations when you go into that. There is a quantum Lyapunov exponent, which is defined by these commutators. 
okay but uh, quite apart from that uh, indeed you're right i mean the, you cannot directly take from uh, position momentum and then go to uh, the quantum case now coming to the case of the hydrogen atom as such you can ask the following question that uh, let's consider this as a classical problem the helium or the hydrogen atom that's what you said hydrogen atom in electromagnetic field what happens so let's take uh, just electric field strong electric field or uh, uh, maybe we'll take a magnetic field okay strong magnetic field in the in some direction so now the you know about the zeeman effect so there will be some splittings and all that but with strong enough magnetic fields which means practically around 5 tesla the magnetic force on the particle becomes comparable with the coulomb force and what happens is that the spherical symmetry of the potential gets broken and so the angular momentum only in, along the direction of the magnetic field is conserved the other two directions are broken and therefore if you study the problem as a classical problem after all you can study this as a classical hamiltonian problem with the electron there you will find that it's fully chaotic you would you can find uh, the regions like i showed you phase space you will find that it's chaotic for energies which are larger so that is why the ground state may not be chaotic but as the excited states as the energy grows it will start going into regimes which are chaotic so now you may say okay now we know that the classical system is now chaotic at these energies what is the corresponding quantum spectrum how do these energy levels look the spectroscopy of this so you should go back and look at the these experiments which were done uh, about the spectroscopy and you will find that uh, now the energy levels of the hydrogen atom they will also be having properties like these random matrix properties which i showed you about uh, the billiards or the nuclei so although yes indeed there is no position and momentum but that's the whole point about quantum chaos how do we define quantum chaos and so this is some of the signatures of quantum chaos that people looked at but you may take the this thing that if there is a classical limit as in this case of the hi hydrogen atom there is a classical limit and then you can study the classical limit but problem becomes worse with something like the icing model or spin half where there is no classical limit in that case you define quantum chaos as those systems which have statistical properties of random matrices okay sir thank you we have another question so with quantum uh, entanglement uh, reduce the latency of long distance data transmission sorry i'm not understanding the question okay so could quantum entanglement reduce the latency in long distance data transmission uh reduce the latency is that the word yeah 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 latency reduce the latency i i understand that you're asking Okay, I'm not sure. Can I understand. I don't know what that means. I'm not okay. Yeah, I understood. So I can go to the next question. So how common a quantum entanglement is the microwave and the millimeter wave bands? Uh, please repeat again. Oh yeah, maybe uh, maybe if I so, can read it also, it is there. Yeah, how yeah, common, yeah, yeah. Uh, how common is quantum entanglement in the microwave and millimeter wave bands? uh yes previous question is this one okay okay i actually i don't know what is latency i should okay. say in long distance transmission i i don't know uh, about microwave and millimeter wave bands again if i may understand you see uh quantum entanglement is between degrees of freedom or between particles so in an uh, electromagnetic field uh there are some proposals about entanglement but really whether they are quantum or not is something which is debatable so exactly what you are talking about uh, in an entanglement in what is not very clear to me up enough uh but there are experiments for example very nice experiments which i did not mention of course there were there were uh, there are a lot of experiments by the way uh there is one experiment which has to do with microwave cavities and there are there is again you can have a microwave cavity which is the shape of a billiard uh, like a stadium billiard and then you can ask what are the resonances in such a billiard and i mean in such a cavity and if you make the cavity thin uh, 
that is along the z direction it's uh, it's very small along the x y direction it is uh, large uh, put to put numbers it's like uh, uh, maybe about uh, order of meter in this uh, x y direction and this z maybe millimeters then it is effectively a 2d billion so this has been studied for a while and because the helmholtz equation is the same as the schrodinger equation it is an analogy experiment it's not really quantum chaos but it is wave chaos and there are all these things that we find there you will find in these resonant cavities you will find that the frequencies have distributions like these random matrix properties so you can look at uh, for example there is experiments by a person called steven anlage from university of maryland uh, and then there is this book by on quantum chaos in fact by one of the experts on uh, on this one of the experimentalists who did this work uh, the name slips my mind <laughs> if anybody writes to me it's a very well known book on quantum chaos actually but this name slips, slips my mind but there is a class of work like that but actually there's no entanglement there as far as i know because it's just waves and chaos but there's no i can't think about it as a many particle system Yeah, Dev Malia is asking. Yeah, yeah, Dev Malia is asking. I mean, actually, I'm sorry that I cannot interact. I mean, if the, somebody would like to clarify, they could well clarify. And uh, Dev Malia, how is quantum chaos experimentally verified? And this is a similar mm -hmm. question. So, is the experiment evidence of the chaos convincing? Same. Dev Malia is not convinced of the experiments. <laughs> but there are experiments which are going on from 1990s at least okay so the wide actually even earlier i would say that actually maybe the field even started with experiments those are called microwave ionization experiments uh, so that was actually i, I well I, that's what it says so you have uh, just hydrogen atoms in uh, time varying magnetic field uh, ele electric fields microwave fields and the ionization of that seem to be uh, uh, seem to uh, actually not be explained by usual uh, theories and then it needed multi photon ionization and there's a whole lot of things but it's actually an example of chaos so if you look at experiments of peter koch in uh, 80s or even earlier that sort of thing is there and uh, many many experiments cold atoms and so on there's no there's no question about uh, doubt in this because the doubt is to do with just quantum mechanics quantum chaos just as you know can you have a doubt about classical chaos no because well it's just mechanics this is the same with quantum chaos actually the only thing is that experiments are harder to find because you have to do things in the frequency domain or time domain time domain experiments are now being done like i showed you a few experiments uh frequency time domain i mean frequency domain like this microwave thing or hydrogen atom and so on are also very old and then there are a lot of experiments to do with uh, uh, quantum dots mesoscopic systems uh, so you, you name it there are a lot of experiments quantum chaos and quantum field theory interacting field theories will be chaotic Uh, for example one of the major models now that people are studying is called the sachdevi kitave model syk model the syk model is a strong model of chaos it's basically as chaotic as you can get the syk model so um of course it's not a field theory again it's a fermion model but it's connected to field theory uh, models so field theories lattice sketch theories all of them i mean uh, uh, as long as you have uh, as long as you have a non integrable theory quantum chaos will show up as as simple as that so the only things that escape chaos is harmonic oscillators and bunch of that so it's only free field theories the fact that one doesn't see them is because we are getting away with approximate uh, perturbation theories and free field theory i mean near free, free field theories so like for example the electromagnetic uh, qed uh we're getting away because photon photon interactions are very weak and uh therefore we're getting away with it. but qcd you can't get away with that strong interactions so qcd you have to face this entire chaos business and that's what i showed some of the results of qcd are precisely that 
well, you saw the experiments from very early on. That's what Vigna uh, saw the whole thing about you know, resonances and uh, nuclei. If you do that, so nuclear physics is actually full of matrix theory. If you once start studying excited states and resonances. So thank you. So this will be the last question. What is the quantum? Entanglement in neutrino oscillation and can quantum entanglement of neutrino pairs be employed for long distance uh, cryptographic uh, distribution? I don't know what is the uh, I don't know the answer to this because I don't know what is getting entangled. Neutrino oscillations, as far as I know, I'm not an expert. Is you know you have some flavors of neutrino that are oscillating, so. I don't know what is getting entangled. Can a quantum entanglement of neutrino pairs be employed? Maybe it can be, but I don't know what is the freedoms that are getting entangled. You know, maybe polarization or some, I don't know whether the spin is getting entangled with position or something like that. It's possible, but that's what, as long as you have any two degrees of freedom that are talking with each other, you can have entanglement. Long distance cryptography, yeah. This, I mean, I, I would consider myself not really uh, eligible to quite comment on that. Yes, sir. So, thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation and exciting discussion session, sir. Uh, it was a great webinar and exciting too, and students have uh, enjoyed it. So, the, uh, the main aim of our program is to motivate uh, our students in this corona pandemic situation. So, we are very happy to. <laughs> do this and uh, thanks again for helping us uh, in arranging this uh, type of important it was my pleasure <coughs> it was my pleasure i'm sorry that there was not more of an interaction in the usual sense but uh yeah. that's fine i understand the limitations of the uh, mode yes. yeah this is so thanks again sir and Thank you for the in your future after the covid i will definitely invite you to uh, it will be my pleasure to come and uh, hope yeah hope to see you also in general thanks a lot okay, sir. Yeah. Thank bye you sir again. bye everyone Thank you.